Bowery at Midnight is fascinating for a bunch of reasons, and we'll think about some of them in the next little bit here. So, like Sex Maniac, it's a zombie movie that has a really strong investment in a crime story. Okay, and I mentioned in some earlier lectures, maybe a couple earlier lectures, that crime stories are very, very significant to the zombie as it emerges in American cinema and in just storytelling in general. And we'll talk about that in a moment. It has a lot to do with the Gothic in North America. But we'll put that aside for a second. One of the things I want you to notice about this film because it's so significant to the rise of Gothic literature in the U.S. near the end of the 18th, uh, near the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, is that there's this whole commentary on on psychology and its significance to crime or disorder, which is something that we saw referenced in Sex Maniac, kind of very explicitly. But as I was discussing in our very first lecture together, when I was talking about the rise of Gothic literature in the you know, late 19th century, early 20th century, we started to get a lot of authors, or some very notable authors, who were starting to, to introduce the concept of you know, mental illness in one form or another, usually not understood at all, specifically, but just as a trope, just as a theme, into the Gothic tale. So for example, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's uh, The Yellow Wallpaper, okay, uh, late, uh, late 19th century short story, um, an excellent short story that I'd recommend to anybody. Um, we also realize that we are about a decade or two out from the major works of H.P. Lovecraft. This film comes out in 1941. Lovecraft is intensely invested in the, in the relationship between what he calls madness and terror, as well as horror, in a number of his short stories. And there's precedent in this for the, in the American scene as well. You can go back much earlier, of course, to the works of Edgar Allan Poe, okay, in really the middle and first half of the, um, uh, the, the 19th century, where there's this constant threat of kind of losing uh, grip your grip on reality, okay? And so this is a strain of, uh, this is a concern, this is a theme, um, and, and the relationship between such things and crime, okay, is a big part of the American psyche. And we might ask ourselves, why is that the case? Well, I think Gibbons gives, gives us a pretty good answer, even though he never explicitly states it. Because one of the things Gibbons tells us is that, again, these early American authors are really struggling to figure out where it is, how it is they can create others, right? Big O others. And they do it, Gibbons claims, by othering native populations as well as immigrants. One of the things that he overlooks, although there are a couple of comments about um, different efforts to, uh, to, psych to, to, to bring psychological understanding from the 19th century to different groups of people. But one of the ways in which this also happens is with an othering of um, individuals with, uh, with, with mental illness in the United States. And there's this long, very sad history in the United States, particularly in the 19th century, of how people were cared for who had different psychological issues, certainly extending through the 20th century and into present day, in some instances, sadly enough, although things certainly are distinct and much better, most people would say, than they were from the 19th century. And there's a whole interesting history of that, if that's something that you're all interested in. But one of the things that happens in the American context is that a lot of crime fiction uh, kind of stands in and, and is brought in as a uh, subgenre of gothic fiction. And in a lot of American crime fiction, what you tend to find is that a group has been othered. So a group with one particular general kind of psychological issue or another is identified as being, you know, the group to be scared of. And that's happened repeatedly in numerous ways in American popular culture. Why does that happen? Because it's always easy to demonize a minority group, particularly a minority group that people don't tend to have a lot of good information on. So it's a, it's a group like native populations like immigrant populations, that fear mongers are able to kind of whip up a lot of unfounded concerns about in American culture. And again, there's a long history of this in, in America. And in this class, we might understand that in a number of ways. But one of the ways we might understand it is as, you know, this, this literary tradition that's been left with us in North America as we have struggled with our Gothic storytelling tendencies and the efforts, unethical as they may be, of some individuals historically to identify certain populations 
as being potential potential threats to society. And if you don't believe me, just go home and watch any Law and Order television program. I mean, a lot of modern shows will other um, people from the Middle East or or other minority groups. Um, it, sometimes it's so generic as people are simply referred to as terrorists, but there tend to be some cultural signifiers in the films for what that means. But if you go back and watch crime shows from the 90s and from the 80s and from the 70s, you will find a very different set of perpetrators in these films and more often than not what you find is an individual who is associated with some kind of significant childhood trauma or some kind of other disorder which we know today you know is in no way necessarily an indicator that someone is going to be come anything like a threat to society but it's an easy group for storytellers to pick on when they're looking to find people in society to turn into others. So when we read Gibbons, okay, and one of the reasons Gibbons is so important to a film like Bowery of Midnight is because Gibbons is saying, you know, this is how we did it in the 19th century. This is what we did. We othered the native populations, we othered, othered the immigrants. Now, it's not the case that that's ever stopped, but as we get into the 20th century, you know, one of the things we find is that there's this othering of people with different kinds of psychological issues. And that's exactly what we see in Sex Maniac, and it's exactly what we see in Bowery at Midnight. Though, admittedly, in Bowery at Midnight, it's not such an enormous part of the story. But in this break between Dr., excuse me, Professor Brenner and Carl Wagner, the same man, played by Bela Lugosi, right? And in all these scenes that take place in a college classroom where they're debating different aspects of psychology, that is certainly a concern, I think, that the film is trying to present us with. This question of the mind and who's predisposed to be a criminal and who's not predisposed to be a criminal. And, and in this story... We have all kinds of really interesting commentaries going on, okay? So this is a film, 1941. We, we, we're coming out of the Great Depression. We're going into the ramp up into uh, World War II. It takes place in an urban space with a lot of homeless people, a lot of people who are unorganized in society, who don't have a job, who don't have a place to live, the homeless, which is another group that tends to get marginalized and demonized quite frequently. And there's all these comments in the film about not wanting to have Judy work down in the soup kitchen because it's dangerous, because there are bad people down there, right? So there's all these assumptions made by Richard and other people in the film that, you know, you don't want to associate with those people in society because there's something, they're likely to commit a crime simply because of who they are. So you see the bias in the film, right? Very clearly in many scenes. It's also where we have, um, we have uh, Professor Ber Brenner uh, or Carl Wagner, whoever you, however you want to refer to him, kind of working down there and in a way that's very much in keeping with Bishop's uh, art article, he's, he's replicating the colonial experience. So we have this foreign individual who moves in to take over and dominate an indigenous population, in this case the homeless around the Bowery area, and then he transforms them into thugs and murderers and the people who die in the process are literally, thanks to Doc Brooks, right, his mad scientist buddy, turned into zombies. Zombies that are kept in the sub-sub-basement of the gangster hideout, and which are used in a really interesting way at the end of the film. So when we think about all those things, we might say, wow, there's an awful lot to talk about in this film. And I would argue that, yeah, there is an awful lot to talk about in this film. But let's just step back, step back for a second and, and kind of put all of that stuff about, you know, how the film is drawing on the American tradition of, you know, criminals and psychological issues with criminals and all that kind of stuff. Let's just put that aside for a second and say, you know, you could also make some really interesting parallels here between Bowery at Midnight and um, the two most recent films that we've watched in this course, uh, uh, King of the Zombies and Spooks. Uh, Spooks Run Wild. Let's let's think a little bit about that. In both Spooks Run Wild and King of the Zombies, what we saw was the kind of traditional zombie tale, or at least some traditional gothic tales, kind of mixed in with humor. Okay, so what we saw was a broadening of the audience for people who were likely to be exposed to the zombie as a as a creature represented in film, because the the gothic story was being mashed up with another kind of storytelling tradition or another kind of film altogether. So in King of the Zombies, we have all the humor that comes from Jeff, 
right, and um, and, and 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 all this all the significance of that kind of humor to the film. So you have a light-hearted horror film, and in Spooks Run Wild, once again, you have all these scary uh, gothic tropes, but they're never really all that scary because we have the East Side kids who are running around and being obnoxious and making witty comments and puns and acting very much like a mixture of the uh, Three Stooges and the Little Rascals. So once again, we have a scary story made palatable for a broader audience. Here we have what on the surface is pretty much a pure crime story, right? The story of, you know, Carl Wagner and uh, his kind of crime syndicate uh, uh, in the Bowery area. Um, and how it's manipulating people and they're causing havoc and there's kind of unchecked murder and all of this stuff going on. But just below the surface, we have something else. We have this gothic tale. Now, there are some very clear indicators of that to the audience, you know, most significantly, of course, simply having Bela Lugosi in the picture. Uh, because as you have seen already multiple times in this course, he is the front man for the gothic tradition in American film. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lon Chaney, um, you know, Boris Karloff. There are a few others who are really significant, but uh, in terms of this course, anyway, Bela Lugosi is the key player. So his very appearance on stage, even in 41, so about a decade after Dracula comes out, is still for most American audiences going to say, suggest, okay, I have a horror story in front of me. And indeed, there's a great deal of horror in this film. Um, by which I mean murder. We see murders. People get shot. People get died. People die. They're shot in cold blood uh, for petty, petty reasons. Um, it's a level of violence that, um, I mean, it's not graphic in the sense of a contemporary film, but there are people getting shot right and left in this film, and that in and of itself is, is fairly horrifying. But as we, as we get deeper into the film, and we, we encounter this Doc Brooks character, and we get some sense that he's kind of a mad scientist or not quite sure what his background is, where it is he's from exactly, and what does he do with the dead bodies? He turns them into zombies. Now that in and of itself maybe isn't so interesting, but what is interesting and what's really remarkable about this film is that Doc Brooks is clearly a deeply flawed individual. He is quite simply not capable of controlling the zombies, which is why he has to have them locked up in the sub sub basement. So he's not directing them to do anything. And that is remarkable because this is really the first time in this course and really the first time in American cinema where we're going to see zombies that just simply exist without a zombie master. The zombie master created them, Doc Brooks, but he was flawed. He has some severe issues. He can't keep them under control. So he's able to create something he can't control. And those things are zombies. Well, that raises a brand new question. What is a zombie? What is an uncontrollable zombie likely to do, right? We haven't seen that before in this class. In a contemporary American culture, we know what they do. They seek out brains and they eat them, or they seek out any kind of human flesh and they eat it. That doesn't seem to be what happens in this film. And this is one of the maybe the more interesting moments in the class, the end of this film, when Professor Brenner is kind of chased into the sub-sub basement and he's, he's gone down the stairs and we see the zombies all come out to get him. Now, when you watch that with contemporary eyes, and you see the zombies push him off camera, what do you imagine happens? It's probably the case that you imagine the zombies eating him, even though there is no precedent for that in film. So audiences who went to see this film in 1941 certainly wouldn't have thought that cannibalism what was going to occur, is what was going to happen in that basement. Well, what was going to occur? I mean, we haven't seen zombies strangle anybody. We haven't seen zombies, you know, do anything other than what they've been directed to do. So what were the zombies going to do to this guy? Were they going to overwhelm them? Were they going to, you know, kill him in one fashion or another? How were they going to kill him? I think what we have here is an audience that would indeed not know what happens once that little horde of zombies pushes the bad guy off camera. I think they would see it and they would just say, well, I guess that's the end of him. But how is it they would have imagined his end? I don't know. We see fingers clubbing a man to death at the beginning of this film. 
Um, so we know that there's a certain level of brutality that's expected. Does he imagine they would just club and they would, the, the, does the audience imagine that, you know, he would just be beaten to death, clubbed to death? I don't know. It's a big open question, and it's one that's going to be significant to several films that we'll watch, most notably Carnival of Souls, when we get there uh, in a little bit, which is going to give us a really unnerving representation of the zombie, but that's, that's a little bit in our future. What do zombies do to people besides eat them? Um, a good question. And if we look back on the past in this class, we don't have many examples of what it is that they do. If we think a little bit about a, a zombie we see very early in the film, the giant whose name is escaping me at the moment, that murder has in his employee, the big, big guy with the little goatee, right? Um, the executioner, I believe, was his job. He's very threatening. You know, why is he so threatening? Well, he's threatening because the idea is that he's just this force, this physical force, who could destroy you very easily. Okay, so maybe that's what they think would happen to... Professor Brenner. Maybe they think the zombies will just simply rip him apart limb from limb, or maybe they'll beat him up. Anyway, I've spent enough time talking about that, but the film really raises these interesting questions about what it is the zombies do, and it presents us zombies without a zombie master. It's also interesting in that, much like uh, Spooks Run Wild, um, everything's okay at the end, right? So we have this recuperating Richard and Judy um, and this creepy scene where she's like, yes, 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 to everything he wants to have happen, uh, which is all kinds of gender issues that we haven't even scratched the surface of in this movie yet, or really in many of the movies we've looked at yet this term, but are certainly in front of us and deserve to be discussed. Um, you know, what's going on in that scene? Uh, is she his new zombie? I don't think the filmmakers would have thought of it that way, but we with maybe more contemporary eyes might see it that way. So anyway, you know, Bowery at Midnight is really fascinating because it, 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 it both extends to the storytelling tradition we've been thinking about in this course, but it also presents us with some new images, and it presents us with this concept of zombies without a zombie master. How do we get them? Through crime. Really important. Also notice the significance of law and order to the film. The shootout, um, the, the presence of the police, the near constant presence of the police, and the police and their intervention seems to be the only force that's really capable of undoing the threat that's related to the zombies. I know the zombies take care of the professor at the end of the film. Um, one final note, if this isn't clear yet, notice who the zombies are killing. It's no small matter of symbolism that the individual being destroyed at the end of this film is the man who has represented the zombie master so consistently, either directly or through parody, in zombie films to this point, and as we'll see in future films starring Bela Lugosi, he will return as a zombie master, but he'll be a very different kind of zombie master. He'll be flawed in pretty fantastic ways that we haven't seen before. So we've, we're definitely at a tipping point with Bowery at Midnight in terms of our understanding of what the zombie master is, what zombies are, and we're starting to edge towards this notion that we might be getting into a world where these two things are no longer connected. So for all these reasons, I think it's a really fascinating film. I hope you enjoy it. It's definitely one of the better films that I've been able to present so far to you. Um, it still feels very dated, but in terms of production values and locations and costuming and, and acting in some sections, it's superior probably to everything that we've watched so far. So I, I certainly hope you enjoy it, and I look forward to hearing what it is you have to say about it. <laughs>